Good morning, everyone. My name is Maya Luria with TMC for Seniors, and I am so happy to be back online in January. So welcome to 2023. Um, we are starting off our January with a theme called active aging. And today we are going to be talking about chronic pain and the science of chronic pain. I have Jacob Lashot here with me today. He is a physical therapist over at our TMC Outpatient Therapies. Welcome, Jacob. Thank you, Maya. So Jacob is going to be um, really, he's, we've had a whole series going on about chronic pain. He's going to be talking about the science behind it. Um, if you've missed any of the other presentations, we do have those also recorded, so feel free. I think we've got one more coming up in January as well about nutrition and chronic pain. Um, so you'll be able to catch that one too. So Jacob, I'm going to go ahead and put your PowerPoint up for you so that you can go ahead and jump into it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, ma'am. So yeah, those of you in the in room or uh, just let me know if I'm not loud enough. Um, those of you online, this is also part of our chronic pain series or persistent pain program. This is the science of chronic pain, just so that we can learn about what pain is and how it becomes chronic. Um, but this is way too much information to get into all in one single talk. So the idea here is that I've created a program for Tucson Medical Center, which I think dearly for letting me do this. Um, it's a six part series. So it is several topics. They are all pre-recorded. Um, and they're all going to come up again in the future if someone wants to attend in person. We are in the process of um, making the website uh, more independent so that if someone is in chronic pain and finds their way to this information, that they can independently go through the content and get some helpful tools and know what to do uh, with their chronic pain. So uh, this is an ongoing series. Like Maya said, the next one will be on nutrition in January uh, 26th. So um stay tuned for that one but the, um, there'll be more coming so um so this is the persistent pain program today we're going to be learning about chronic pain how it does become chronic um a little bit of disclosure though there is some products and other resources mentioned in this but i'm not affiliated with any of them they're not paying me to say anything um, but i'll definitely post those at the end of the lecture because they're helpful tools. There's things that people would want to use to figure out um, what would be helpful for their chronic pain. So the goals for this lecture, um, what is chronic pain and why it is different? Um, understanding the nervous system and how it changes over time. And then how does that play a role in what you experience now? How you can change it back and then knowing the tools of how to change it back. Overall, changing the narrative and changing your experience of chronic pain. So I've been going back and forth with um, our marketing communication department trying to figure out how long these things should be. Um, I've definitely heard from them several times that uh, as far as our online content, they want about two minute videos to five minute videos where it's kind of the sweet synopsis of things where you condense the content down to something that people could digest. and. Um, I kind of giggle at myself because, uh, like if I'm scrolling through Netflix and I can't figure out what to watch, you know, sometimes I'll watch a two minute trailer on something and I don't feel like I need to watch the movie at all now because they did a really good job, um, which I can watch six or seven movies in a night sometimes because, uh, I don't actually have to watch the whole thing now. They did a great job, but this is the full feature film here. Um, and I think to do this kind of topic justice, you know, I think someone can get a Cliff's note version of that and be satisfied. But I think uh, we need to dive deep whenever somebody needs a greater understanding of something super important. Um, I kind of made a joke to the same marketing team about, um, you know, returning, uh, learning about my own retirement. You know, I think uh, I met with my financial guy and, you know, he, he asked me from one to five, how much understanding do you have of this retirement and the stock market and things like that? And I said, definitely a one. So explain it to me the most easy way you can. Uh, so he gets to talking. He totally overwhelms me with uh, knowledge and big words and uh, gives me all these spreadsheets. And then I had to stop him and say, uh, you know what? Um, I told you I was a one. Can we start over? And so eventually I kind of resummarized what he had said to me. He basically wanted to take my money and manage it a little tighter so it didn't 
be the mercy of the market where kind of ebbs and flows of the market. He could, he could tweak it just enough so that it stays on track, let's say. And I said, well, why didn't you just say that? And he said, well, you know, it's hard. Um, well, I'm up here trying to explain the universe to somebody that may not know anything about it. And that's kind of tough. So um, be patient with this process. Um, it isn't easy. This is really broad information. Um, it does like explain a recipe here for what chronic pain is and how it develops, but how do you change it? How does one change it? But really a lot of this advice should be individualized to each person's story. You know, if it's a back problem or a knee problem or a concussion, you know, the story needs specifics for it to change. But through this process, you will have to keep an open mind. I'm going to challenge certain things uh, about what you believe to be true, and that's important. Uh, don't take it personally. Um, we're going to look at this as an objective process based on research. So uh, that's the pro I'm always that head on me. I'm always going to be following the research. But there is a general theme here. No brain, no pain. Um, try to hold the intensely personal questions for the end. You know, if I'm going to answer it during this lecture, um, I might cover it. So save it for the end and let's see if we can, you can approach me later. Um, but like I said, this is a very large concept. It's like my retirement guy trying his best to explain to me what my retirement's doing. I have to know as much about it as possible to uh, know that I'm getting my money managed well and not just be totally ignorant to the process. So it's kind of tough when I guess this common generation say adulting, you know, when they're adulting, they have to be a painful adult things uh, like pay attention to their retirement. Um, I just kind of have to do my homework and figure out what it is he's talking about and make sure he's doing okay. So we have to go into the science of it right away. What is pain? Um, it is an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or underlined potential tissue damage. So that's a mouthful. There's a lot going on there and there's a lot to impact. So I'm definitely going to go through all of that. But the underlying potential for tissue damage is probably one of the greater phrases for this whole lecture. Uh, pain is a personal experience, but it is very influenced by all kinds of things, biological, psychological, and social factors. Um, pain and nociception are different things. They are two different things. And I'm going to explain what nociception is. It's really common, most simple example of what people believe pain is. But you can have that and not have pain, and you can have no nociception and pain. And I'm going to have some diagrams up, but this is important to hold on to. So to con uh, continue to describe what pain is, though, through life experiences, individuals learn a concept of pain over time, and that guides the overall experience of what pain is. Um, you know, the, that's, that's, that's what a big takeaway for respecting what person's pain experience is because okay. it's really intensely internal experience. Um, what pain is, is it serves as an adaptive role. It's a protection mechanism. Um, basically, it has uh, many adverse effects on how we function and um, our social and psychological well-being. That, uh, that adaptive role cannot serve a purpose. And we're gonna get into that as well. So there's the messy descriptions of what pain is. So the whole reason I'm doing this, the cost of chronic pain is really, really high. Um, I think everybody's put their ticket in for the mega millions this week. At the time of recording this, I think it was $1.1 $1 .1 billion uh, winnings if you win the mega millions. Next, uh, next drawing's on Friday. Uh, but this is a $600 billion project for the United States. Um, what that breaks down to is treating chronic pain is actually more expensive than heart disease, cancer, and diabetes combined. Um, probably one of the single greatest things is low back pain. Um, it certainly makes up a majority of that cost, and it's probably the second most common thing to the common cold. Uh, as far as absence for work. And I'm going to make a large example of how back pain becomes a chronic pain. Uh, and 
uh, quite a bit of examples of how, how we get to this point, but this is exactly my soapbox. This is a huge expensive problem and this isn't unique to us. Uh, we're the most expensive healthcare system in the world, but some countries actually spend more total uh, dollars on this problem than like their war budget, like Australia spends more total uh, problem uh, money on treating chronic pain and being bad at it, I guess, uh, compared to their war budget. So it's, it's not unique to the United States. Um, so, you know, by the definition of it, uh, something that's chronic has to go over about six months of time. Um, the underlying mechanisms uh, change and they promote a continued sensation of pain. So there is kind of a timeline that we focus on when we call something that's pain to be chronic. Um, so why does pain even exist? Well, it's a signal to warn us. It is our protection mechanism. That's how our nervous system knows how to avoid something in the future. And it teaches us avoidance. So if you burned your hand on the stove, then you know that that stove is hot. Uh, a nervous system has to get to know that. And that's a learned thing. Um, and that's how it's useful. It has to protect our tissues and know that something's damaged. And pain comes from lots of different places. So nociception, which I'm going to have a better picture of this. Um, that's like uh, strains and sprains, fractures, post-operative pain, that kind of thing. Uh, just inflammation by itself does produce pain. So our chemistry about us, um, RA, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, tendonitis, osteoarthritis, anything that's got an itis means inflammatory status. But that chemical thing sensitizes nerves and it tells your body, ouch. Uh, nerves themselves can hurt, uh, like a diabetic neuropathy. Um, and then you can have a kind of combination of things. So immunity can stimulate uh, pain responses in cells around nerves and uh, create kind of this abnormal processing problem, like a fibromyalgia is a common example where there might be some autoimmune context there where your immune system goes a little haywire, attacks your nerve endings and promotes pain all over and kind of gradually changes the nervous system. So, and someone certainly can have a combination of all of these things. Um, that, that's really common after surgeries and sciaticas and that kind of thing. So just giving you a background of there is different kinds of reasons for pain. Um, so this is no C-section. This is the most common, uh, simple picture I can paint. And this is probably where people get hung up because this might actually be the picture people always keep in their mind of what's going on in their body. So there's a little red tack in the skin. Those sensory neurons register nociception. It's a noxious stimulus. So uh, it being noxious basically just means something that your body doesn't like. So it's got to tell the rest of the nervous system all the way up to the brain that something happened. And it's that little that, uh, that little tack. Um, it is just not that uh, simple. So there is a lot of steps in our nervous system and each single one of them has a role in influencing pain and they can turn it up or they can turn it down and it depends on a lot of mechanisms. And I'm going to tell you about some of those mechanisms but all of them influence what your concept of pain is by the time it reaches your brain. And then your brain ultimately does the most modulation to try and figure out, is this a problem? Um, and this is why uh, if you're held up on the simple ver version and you don't know that all of these steps are influenced, then um, this can get kind of complicated for what you think is going on with you. Um, a common analogy I make, so when a pain happens in the body, it can be any one of these steps. Any one of these steps can say, ouch. Um, if there is the telephone game when we're kids, you know, somebody starts out with original message to the first kid, and then it's all kind of fun and games that the last child uh, says something funny because it's not even close to the original message. But in the middle there, somebody messed up, right? And so let's say in chronic pain, one of these steps always messes up. Like there's some run really kid that always messes up the message and maybe makes it louder than it's supposed to be. And then that message always comes out big. So imagine that can happen at all of these steps or any one of these steps or just the last step or the last kid's always messing up the message. But somebody can chronically mess it up all the time and it can learn how to do that well and continue to do it well past its time that's useful. That's chronic pain. 
Um, so as an effect, that's why we have drugs that work at different spots of all these points in the nervous system. So do look at our uh, um, pharmacy. Uh, Sue does a great job talking about um, the medication management and chronic pain in that subsection of the series that we have going on. So if you want to learn more about that, dig into that video. So there's some very big truths about pain itself. Pain is not directly related to tissue damage. It is not a measure of damage to your body. More pain does not mean more damage. It is your brain's best guess that potential damage is going on, and it is not literal. It's like a smoke alarm in the house. Um, we have a crappy oven in our house, and it always seems to burn like the layer at the bottom, and you can't open it without the fire alarm going off in our house. You know, I think the fire alarm's there to tell you if the house is on fire, but I literally 100% of the time, our house has not been on fire. I knock on wood as I say that, but, um, you know, it's, it's always that stupid oven. So imagine that same thing. Imagine the, it's a warning system, right? Usually the house isn't on fire. It's just the smoke is doing it or the oven's doing its thing again. Um, so like I said about, uh, pain being a protective thing, it is, that's its role. It's to warn you. Um, but it can warn you well past its useful time, well past uh, the time of damage or healing timeframes, even when it doesn't know any better. It can learn how to hurt more as time goes on. Um, but, you know, a lot of people that have a lot of pain don't want it anymore. And they always ask, can I just not have pain? There is conditions where people literally don't have any pain and it's actually dangerous. Um, they usually don't live very long. Uh, they die of an infection or burst appendix or, or something happening. They can break something and they don't know it. There's stories of kids like scratching their eyes out and they don't even know it. Um, so pain serves as a warning mechanism. We must have it. So continued truths. Um, so pain is very complicated and it's strange. Uh, it is a learned thing over time. We have to learn that the stove can burn us, but it gets complicated whenever... Uh, it comes down to, let's say, a back injury, which I'm going to make an example of later. Um, the mind and the body are the same. I think we get taught that they are separated, and this just is not true. The nervous system controls the outcome. It rules. It makes all the decisions, and it wins. So no brain, no pain, like I said. Um, the same areas of the brain that control emotions and memories and awareness uh, and a lot of different categories all share communication with the regions that ultimately produce pain. So that's why pain is a learned thing because it takes in context all of the things that influenced it in your past life. Um, an initial injury can happen and also can heal, but the nerves, the nervous system can remember for you. It's there to serve you as a warning towards risk in the future but it stayed past its useful time. That's chronic pain. It's the nervous system that's ultimately changed over time. They call that nociplastic pain. So nociception was the original simple picture that you get attack in your skin and it tells the brain, ouch. Um, plasticity in the nervous system just means it changes. Um, so it changes every time we need to learn a new task. It changes for you without your permission when we get pain. So nociplastic pain is basically a nervous system changing to become more sensitive to the same thing over time for your protection. So let's say somebody left that thumbtack in all the time for end of eternity, eventually your nervous system gets super sensitive to it. And every time it wiggles, it reports more and more pain with less provocation as time goes on. So then all the nerves on all those tracks and the brain can change in this chronic rewiring process to make it more painful, uh, disproportionate to actually mechanically what's going on in there. So, so much so that uh, International Association for Study of Pain has an algorithm for us clinicians trying to figure out who has actually gone through this chronic nervous system rewiring process. Or is that somebody coming into me the way they explain their pain? Is there a way of figuring out is this possibly a nociplastic situation where the nervous system's actually modified itself a bunch? Or is there something we need to go in there and change? So uh, it's kind of a busy slide, but it's actually meant for more clinicians. So any clinicians listening in on this, they can take a screenshot here. Um, but that being said, uh, I think you've gathered by this point that chronic pain and how it's developed is super complicated. 
it's a combination of our overall biology, genetics, um, social interactions, and psychological components. You know, uh, it can come down to your education about your condition, what your activity levels are like, lifestyle factors, your perceptions and beliefs. And then there's just a lot of unknowns about why we get this way. And I'll tell you a story of uh, an actual patients that I've had. So um, this is one of the biggies though. Inflammation at any one of those steps along the way is probably one of the greater ways that the nervous system actually changes itself. Um, so down at the bottom, it says peripheral sensitization. So imagine that as so a local surface area, uh, there's a lot of inflammatory things going on at that area those nerves there can get rewired itself to be more sensitive over time so that step can go awry and basically amplifying the signal like the first kid in the telephone game uh, central sensitization is basically when it goes from that nerve to your cord so that junction there gets a lot of talk and remodification where if you've got inflammation around that area which i'm going to make an example of low back pain that area gets remodified really well and then your brain ultimately does the best reorganization. Um, and an inflammation, like if inflammation's in someone's body for a really long time, every one of those steps can actually get rewired in such a way where pain gets an amplified warning system that's kind of unnatural. Um, so to further get more change in the nervous system, uh, your immune system gets to play a role in all of this, and um, your beliefs and experience we're certainly going to pick apart with some studies I'll show you. Um, past memories and stress and those things all have a play and role in this, so I'll give you examples. And like I said about this being the full feature film of information, you know, it just doesn't do it justice uh, to give the Cliff Notes version. You can get away with it, but I think you're left with less understanding and maybe less tools to help know how this can change so uh, i'll try not to get into entirely too much detail like my financial guy did i'm going to try the best to make it the lay version as possible um so we've got fancy uh mri machines they're called functional mri machines that we kind of see what parts of your brain you're using when you think of stuff or when you're doing stuff so when it comes to just thinking about something, you can see the bright orange areas in a brain. Um, that's where they kind of pop up. So um, that's so I'm going to talk to you about the very next section. But the chronic pain, um, the brain uses about 44 total regions of the brain combined to consider, is this pain? Is this a problem? Is this something I need to warn the organism about? Ultimately, after a long time of having it, it actually just looks like depression. Um, and in healthy controls, you don't see certain regions of the brain light up. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so many places have a role. Um, I'm not going to name any of them. Uh, just showing you this wrinkly, wrinkly brain that we have. And it has different parts. And some are more important for uh, development of chronic pain. And I'll get into the behavior aspect of that. Um, but here's an example of how that brain of hers rewires itself. Just take veterans of any war and have MRI data before and after, and you'll see this chronic wide spread networks into the painful regions kind of communicate with each other more. Um, and it's really common problem you'll see for lots of different conditions. Um, so that fMRI, that functional MRI, where we can see the, the pain centers light up, um, basically the certain centers of the brain aren't supposed to light up whenever you're in pain and that's pretty teachable and then it actually modifies itself over time so this is a, a an actual person in a study um, certain parts of those regions of the brain like the uh, middle grayer brain i guess the one with the most orange going up this middle that's probably the most you're supposed to experience uh, if you're thinking about doing something. So we have something called our motor co cortex. Um, if I'm gonna think about doing something like moving this finger right now, there's a certain part of my brain that controls just that. That's what you would see moving in there or lighting up whenever somebody's doing something. But gradually, uh, as somebody unlearns pain, and I'll show you another diagram, it should be much less of these regions lighting up. So it should be much less orange areas if somebody's getting stimulated. 
So this person's in an MRI machine and they've had terrible low back pain for a long time. And they do something called a pelvic tilt or even just thinking about doing a pelvic tilt, which is basically you just tuck your tail underneath you and you kind of roll your pelvis under. Um, so in someone in chronic pain where it's a really ramped up, dialed up nervous system towards something like that, and they've always learned that that's painful, you'll see the brain light up like this. Uh, when in a, in a healthy situation, you shouldn't. And then eventually over time, if you get that person's nervous system to rewire itself back to a way that's more normal and healthy, that they shouldn't light up as well. They should light up just like a normal control subject. So um, one of the so uh, one of the greatest reasons that this changes is fear. Uh, there's a little arrow pointing to it's an area called the amygdala, and I'm going to dive into that guy real heavily. Um, pain sucks, and it's not really fun to have. And the longer you have it, the more you fear it. And this amygdala of ours plays a giant, giant role in developing this rewiring process that makes pain a greater experience than it has to be. So this is from a study called Pain Reprocessing Program. So chronic pain people, people that have been in long-term chronic pain for multiple reasons, usually people don't have just one thing. They usually have multiple comorbidities like other health factors like heart disease and diabetes. Uh, they don't just have back pain. They usually have knee pain and other things. But at the top of the um, diagram is brains that are lit up with a little bit more color. And then by the end, uh, I think the timeline is even on here. It says 67 weeks. There's those brains not lit up anymore. And this is literally the process of what I'm talking about. Of people are, do experience pain. Um, they're seeing how much pain they're in on the brain. And then gradually unlearn it as they go through this targeted rewiring process of getting the brain to not have pain during certain cir circumstances that made them have pain in the beginning. This is with real people um, and it works. So I like to show that up there because I think everybody thinks about their own individual story and wants to compare, but this isn't real. Like I said, the science is there and we're going to be looking at this process in a very objective way. Probably the most great example here about how no brain, no, no, brain, no pain is something called phantom limb pain. Pain is really weird. Um, I said about moving my finger, I've got one single part of my brain that's supposed to be in charge of controlling that. That's ultimately what drives all of your experience. So someone that's lost a limb, they could still have pain in the limb that doesn't exist at all um, because the brain thinks so. They still have representation in their brain that that exists. And until that rewires itself such that it doesn't represent a leg, it's still going to exist as pain. So we have to get crafty in, in uh, therapy with tricks and mirrors and different brain tricks and stuff to kind of teach them actually that their nervous system doesn't have a, a leg anymore. And then it actually stops hurting. So feeling is believing though, you know, when you've had chronic pain and it's telling you pain, pain, pain all the time, it's really hard to not believe that. But when you don't have a leg, it kind of gets easy. So it's probably one of the more dramatic examples of pain as a brain phenomenon. So, that's a, this is called a homunculus. Um, I only put it on here so I could say that word, but the basically different parts of your brain do are um, uh, solely denoted to just controlling certain body parts. And this is the thing that's got to change. So uh, the internal part kind of in the middle there where there's a right and left hemisphere meeting, that's where legs are shown. That's what's got to remodel itself so that one doesn't have pain in their leg anymore that doesn't exist. This thing modifies itself in chronic pain all the time. And it gets really smudged and actually gets kind of messy where this motor map of us doesn't get very good at uh, its job. We get kind of just uncoordinated when we've had a messy chronic pain problem. People get uncoordinated and they don't use their body very well. And remapping this is part of the art of getting their chronic pain problem to go away. So when it comes to uh, this wrinkly brain of ours, um, you know, in therapy, we're always remodeling the brain. That neuroplasticity was what we do all the time. We do that for stroke rehab. We do that for chronic dizziness. It doesn't change for any mechanical orthopedic thing like a low back pain that thinks poorly of its own back pain. It needs to learn. 
So an example of music, whenever we uh, learn to play the piano, when you do studies on people, some of the wrinkles on the back of the brain grow big. And when you quit playing the piano, they go away. You can actually see this thing change in real time based on what's happening. It, this brain of ours always adapts to whatever experiences we're going through. And this is the process that happens without your permission towards chronic pain. It rewires itself in these wrinkly little ways that makes it more painful. But this is happening all the time. It's always modifying based on what we need to know. Like all your math classes you forgot at this point in life. So like I said about fear, um, that's a giant influencer. Um, I would say this tactic that this person's doing for what's called exposure therapy is probably not the best approach. Um, you know, the, how much fear and perception of this fearful thing of pain over time drives the greatest experience. So if anyone's seen the movie called, uh, Free Solo, this is Alex Honnold. He's the guy climbing this, uh, yellow Yosemite that's called El Capitan. He doesn't have any ropes, go climbing gear, no aids. He's seriously just standing there right now on the edge of a cliff. Uh, that's his brain lit up on the top there compared to someone else. So there's more red than there is blue. Uh, the red person's the control and his brain's the blue. The amygdala, the fear center of our brain is the thing that's supposed to make us scared of being on this uh, cliff right now. His is not. Uh, in that movie, this is just an example, um, but this in the movie, basically when they're, he's supposed to be experiencing pain in this situation, he doesn't. And that's powerful enough for him to actually climb and put himself in risk like this. If you watch the movie, it seems like he's more fearful of like relationships and things rather than like climbing on the edge of a mountain. But in reality, his nervous system should be totally afraid of climbing this mountain. He can die, right? Um, but in context of things, you don't get to choose that. He didn't, I don't know if he'd know, he didn't choose this. He just enjoys climbing so much. But you see the same phobia center light up in someone's brain that's like amazingly afraid of bugs. And, you know, but then that same person cannot be afraid of sharks, which doesn't make any sense. Right. So how much you fear your painful condition or fear doing things drives the nervous system uh, rewiring process probably to the greatest extent. Um, so much so that when they like turn off the amygdala and rats and then they do experiments on them for about everything that we're supposed to sense. So like pressure, uh, touch, light touch, deep touch, uh, hot and cold. Uh, abrasive things, basically every single one of those normal things that we're supposed to feel in our nociception won't turn into any sort of pain in the brain unless this step along this uh, pathway is involved. But the more it's involved, the more this becomes pain. So it's really powerful. So then what happens in chronic pain is your nervous system gets to be more sensitive over time and it has a very, a very narrow operating window. It basically used to be a tolerant of a lot of things, and then that tolerance range gets more narrow and narrow and narrow. Um, and basically, what we do is we end up doing less and less. So you hurt, so you don't do things. So when you try to do things, then you hurt more. So you do even less, and then you get stuck in this loop. And this pain experience needs to be broken down by ultimately not fearing whatever it is that makes you painful and uh, confronting it, exposing yourself to that like a phobia, like a exposure therapy that a phobia uh, person would go through and ultimately recovery. I'm gonna go into that a little deeper. I can't just say it out loud and that's a super complicated thing. It's just gonna click in everyone. So. so we are gonna dive into perception because perception of things is pretty uh, key in what you believe to be true. Um, so this is a few examples of exactly what I'm talking about. The nervous system can't be taken literally. Uh, pain is the brain's best guess. It's its opinion, but it's just guessing at reality all the time. It has to paint a picture for our nervous system about what's going on all the time. It has this terrible burden task of like painting reality. So I'm gonna show you a few examples of how wrong it can get, but that can also uh, be part of the reason why chronic pain develops, because if you truly believe what you experience, sometimes that drives someone's chronic pain changes. So these two lines in the middle are actually the same length. Some of you get that. Some of them are kind of blown away by that. If you've seen this drawing, but it's only purely because the arrows on the end make one look longer than the other. It's just an eye trick, right? So 
further eye tricks, this little diagram uh, is either an elderly woman looking towards you with the hood on, or it can be a young woman looking away from you with their face turned away. And your brain can kind of switch back and forth because of the play on image. Our eyes only have like rods and cones and they can only see light and color. And your brain has this terrible burden of making up image, like making up what you see. And that's reality. And that's not much different from like taking a sensation in your body and making sense of what it is that's going on. So in this, your brain can actually kind of switch back and forth between these two images and see the both young and old woman. And these are just examples about your brain actually just kind of is fallible, right? Um, this, if you stare at it, it kind of looks like the hole is getting bigger and maybe makes some of you kind of dizzy. I guess this is true at about 80% of the people in the study that look at it. So the hole's not getting bigger. Your eyes don't know how to make sense of this. Uh, it's actually expanding it for you. It thinks you're walking into a darkened room and you need to make your eyes dilate so that you can adjust your uh, vision towards a darker environment. And so your nervous system can get this wrong. Like if I look away from my screen and come back, it expands again. Um, that's it getting it wrong. It's, it's not moving, but when you look at it, it seems like it. Um, seeing is believing though. That's the hard part about it. So if I look at, um, the A and B squares that are labeled on that checkerboard, the top square where that cylinder is, A looks like a darker shade than B. When you put lines on them, you see that they're not. So in reality, the top square, the B is actually a dark shade, just like A, but you can't unsee that. You could switch your eyes back and forth between the one that's got the lines on it. So you can see that it's actually dark on the bottom, but in the middle, it's not. It's dark, but you can't see it. Your brain makes that up. It's filling in the blanks. So it does its best job to like guess consciousness. It's a controlled hallucination, but your brain can get it really wrong all the time on. This is just an example of seeing, hearing, feeling, and ultimately pain. So changing your perception of what you experience is something that you have to dig into. But knowing your body can get wrong is pretty important because whenever there's a violation of what you expect, like your brain is expecting certain things, then that's when learning changes. You can change it based on if you're taking this learning opportunity in an optimistic way and learn how to make it good, or you could take it in a pessimistic way and actually end up ending with a chronically changed nervous system that is more painful over time. So like, here's an example of perception. Uh, they did a study, it's called Mind Over Milkshake. Um, basically your own thoughts control what you feel. So they had two different milkshakes. They labeled one as low calorie and low, um, I think healthy and nutritious, and it won't fill you up, I think is what they said. And then they said one labeled with 620 calories, and then it's gonna be filling and it's gonna be full of fat. And in reality, they lied to everybody and they, they basically gave them the same milkshake and you got exactly what you thought. So if you got the light milkshake, you were hungry later. You, your brain literally made you hungry later, despite there being a difference in, uh, they're actually a calorie content. The other people said they were full and they didn't ask for anything later. Um, but it's amazing, you get this chemical cascade in your, in your brain where your stomach actually grumbles and those hormones go to work and your blood sugar even gets changes and there's amazing like actual physical differences in the human body because you just think that there's a difference between these two. Um, migraine studies are interesting because there is medications to control migraines. So if you put different little bags in front of people with randomized pill mounts, and then you lie to people like indiscriminately, like uh, an actual pill or people know what a placebo is, which is a fake pill, like a sugar pill, or you give them half the dose or you give them some of the dose. Uh, the effect of lying to them was much, much greater than the dose. So people got relief with migraine medication when they thought they were getting a decent dose and they got relief when they thought they were getting the medication when they got no dose. They actually, the, the, it followed exactly with the dose that they got, I guess, was, was the relief. So uh, the brain is kind of a prediction machine. It's always trying to guess the next step. And this is really common, like, example of placebo. 
um, they, that's how medications actually make it to the next stage. You got to see if they're actually worthwhile. Um, like changes in performance are always a fun one because it's always fun to mess with athletes because they're, you always think they're young and healthy. Um, so there is a genetic condition where, uh, if you have this one gene, it makes you bad at exercise, like intolerant for heavy exercise. And, um, again they lied to people they basically had people do a vo2 max test where they run as hard as they can on a treadmill and uh some people had the gene some people didn't and again they found that the effect of lying to them showed their uh performance drop greater than actually having the gene so if they didn't have the gene and they lied to them and said they did you saw their performance drop if they had the gene and you lied to them and said they didn't they actually performed well so the effect again was lied to them. So uh, human body is super complicated, but the nervous system seems to control the outcome in the end. This is one of my giant soapboxes. I can't stand it. Uh, we live in Arizona. I'm not from here, but uh, your perception of whether or not weather affects your pain is probably greater than the mechanical thing that weather can offer you. Um, there is a study out there that's probably the best that shows that there is a correlation. It's called uh, cloudy with the chance of pain. Um, it's an app. And I don't know if you can download it anymore, but it probably came out with the best correlation that yes, this can exist, but it did say that um, your perception of it was probably greater than the actual mechanism. And then ultimately they never actually determined what mechanism it was. They individually had humidity, uh, temperature, Barometric pressure, uh, changes in pressure, or whatever. They had a lot of different metrics, and none of them came on top. And I think people muddied the, the study too much. Like they always, were, they think that they're having pain, right? And the people that are the most sensitive to weather changes is people in San Diego, Las Vegas, and Phoenix. The people that complain the least about it is the people that live in crappier weather. So Minnesota, upstate New York, Ohio. Uh, this is the study in just the United States. Um, so they, the people that have it the best complain the most. So your perception of it's kind of influences the outcome. So how much does the brain actually control the outcome? Uh, it turns out it controls how sick you are, believe it or not. Um, you think that immune system gets to working and fighting off a bug and then turns up the temperature as in fever and starts to make you ache because that's probably doing chemical things to like get rid of stuff. But in reality, it all talks to your thalamus, which is in your brain, and then it gets together with the rest of your brain and says, this is how sick you are. It decides how sick you are. It gets to control the dial. So um, that's actually modifiable as well, which is a deeper topic and I won't get into. So the tale of two nervous systems. So this is uh, not her actual pelvis, but her. this is a patient of mine that had a pelvis that looked like this. I had two people that came into the clinic in the same week that both fell off a horse in the year 2000. One fractured her pelvis just like this. She went on to become a university professor here at the U of A and has not had pain since. Um, she only came to see me because her hip, uh, which in this photo you can see the hip, it doesn't have any arthritic changes, uh, had basically become arthritic. It did not hurt, but she wanted it to not hurt and she wanted exercises for the gym. So this is how I met this person. I had another person that also fell off a horse in 2000, did not sustain all of these fractures, just hurt his back, and from then on was on disability since year 2000. The complication of how chronic pain develops uh, is part of the story. So, you know, the two nervous systems had different experiences. Some of it is their past beliefs. How bad was the trauma? Obviously, one person had an amazing amount of trauma, like enough that they had to pin her pelvis together. And some person had more or less soft tissue injuries, like uh, disc injuries and uh, ligamentous strains and stuff. Falling off a horse hurts. But anyway, it depends on their course of care after this, right? It depends on who told them what, what kind of scans did they have, what kind of language did they have. And I'm going to get into that. But it can be this powerful on how the uh, nervous system rewires itself is dictated by a ton of absolute things. So this person with an amazing amount of damage, no pain. Uh, the other person with, by the time probably three or four months go by, tissues usually heal, had an amazing amount of pain to the point where they did not work. Eventually I did work with this person and they returned to work after 
uh, I guess it would be about 15 years. So here's a kind of a dramatic example. These are two different uh, construction workers that both shot themselves with a nail gun. One guy tripped and shot himself in the face and didn't know it. Um, he went to the dentist, I think six days later, and uh, the dentist sent him to the emergency room immediately because he's got a nail in his skull. It missed everything important, of course, and he never experienced a single bit of pain. So that's example of a damage and no pain because the brain didn't think that was a problem. Uh, the other one is actually a nail through a foot, but he missed. He didn't know it. He shot himself in the foot, he thinks. And uh, this is a famous story. He went to the emergency room. He had a steel toe boot. Uh, they thought it was going to swell so bad that um, he was going to start losing function in his foot. So they sedated him, cut off the boot, and found out he went right between his toes. So from this, from this story, uh, picture, it's 2D, so you're looking at it from the side. And so you think, damn, this is right in this guy's foot, but actually it's going between his toes. So this guy passed out from pain, but it, it didn't hit a single bit of tissue. So two dramatic examples and kind of famous stories when people are teaching about chronic pain and how pain is influenced ultimately by the brain's thought and perception of what's happening. So this veteran had a bullet in his neck for 60 years. Uh, he was in World War II and he ran away. Uh, while he was getting shot at and he didn't know it and war's complicated and scary and you know it's everything's happening fast but he fell on the street and they wanted to check out his neck and make sure he was all right and they found out his bullet was in his neck but it never hurt him um, but the brain the, the the brain is so powerful and all those steps in the brain are actually so powerful that it can be really modifiable over time the nervous system uh, prefers speed over accuracy so it has to make fast decisions um, for your survival rather than getting it right. It'd rather be fast than right. Because let's say if you're crossing the street, you sprain your ankle and a car's coming, it's going to turn off your signals that you're sprained your ankle. It's probably going to make it not hurt so that you can get out of the way of that car because that's more important, right? I had to find a blurred out image of this dude. He's in running with the bulls in Spain. Uh, his legs blurred out because it does look very bad. He got gored. And he doesn't know it. He's got this smile on his face as he runs away. Um, but it's pretty more important he gets away from that bowl. And the nervous system is so powerful. You get to hear these crazy stories like uh, some mother lifting their car off their child and like doing amazing physical things because your nervous system, it gets to turn up the signal or turn down the signal. It can make chronic really sensitive pain or it can make you feel absolutely nothing. Like in this scenario where his legs flayed open. So much so that uh, this is this is up to you in a conscious decision to actually decide how much tissue damage you're going to feel. Um, I could have put a lot of examples up here, but tattoo is kind of common. Uh, I would say people that are in chronic pain, they really like their area being tattooed. This is the stories I get. They almost feel like it's a pleasant thing. I, I think there's a context thing because they're getting something that means something to them on their body. But they are willing to get this painful thing done to have this experience. Uh, some of them enjoy the process. I'll admit plenty of them say it hurt like hell. But uh, you can do this consciously and you can do this unconsciously. So the guy running from the bowl, that was pretty unconscious. He needed to get going so he didn't get run over by the bowl. But in this scenario, this guy definitely knows he's getting a tattoo. So it's called descending modulation. So... Um, the original picture of pain and how it works, I showed you how the signals go up to the brain, but it's actually a two-way street where the red arrow is going down through all of those same steps. The pain can go up and modulate, modulate all of those steps to rewire them so that they turn up the signal, and the red arrow can turn them down at all steps. And it usually starts with the brain. How you believe and what you believe to be true is really important for turning down the next set of signals. Um, so I'm going to make an example of low back pain uh, and how this actually happens. The healthcare system totally contributes to this problem. Um, it has to come down to education. I know doctors are uh, strapped for time. They don't have time to explain a lot of this stuff. Timing is certain important. If somebody gets hurt and it gets to be a delayed process, they certainly fester on a problem. They catastrophize it. They turn it into something 
they're living with their pain and have no options. The longer that goes on, the more the nervous system starts rewiring itself already. Um, you know, the, seeing the correct people at the right time, how that care is delivered, what kind of support system you have, it gets to be kind of complicated. <laughs> Such so that most low back pain is probably one of the more poorly misguided treatments we have in history. Um, there's a, a lot of misinformation provided to them about how things heal, what happens, what degeneration is like, what an MRI contributes to their pain. Um, and ultimately, I have to scold a lot of providers and say, you just have to get better at communicating these things. And I'm going to get into that. So like I showed you all of those steps along the nervous system, one that's in that central sensitization picture uh, is where basically like your nerves go from the outside nervous system to your core is the DRG. So uh, dorsal root ganglion has a lot of uh, thinking uh, sensory neurons there where it's in a place where it gets squished often. Uh, most common place is your L5 on S1, your last vertebrae in your spine where you do something forceful, the disc squishes out on the bottom there um, and it starts touching that nerve. Uh, that nerve is, it's actually toxic. So the internal components of our disc promotes an autoimmunity towards attacking the nerve itself and inflames it and makes it really mad. And then that local area can rewire itself to turn up the signal and tell your brain, ouch, and for a really long time. How you talk to people really influences the difference. So basically, whenever somebody comes in, they blew a disc, they got an MRI, uh, you know, what's said to that person in the next few steps dictates the rest of their life. What they don't get told very often is that 70% of the time in six weeks, discs reabsorb spontaneously. That's normal. They heal like a sprained ankle. Ligaments, uh, sorry, the discs uh, themselves are made up of concentric rings of ligaments, just like your ankle is made of ligaments. It's got the same tissue healing time frame. If you've ever done a decent ankle roll, uh, you actually literally tore some stuff. Some people hear pops. I did on my last ankle roll. That stuff heals. The body heals. It's good at it. The ligaments in the body that make up the discs are no different, but it really depends on lots of things. So it can do this on its own. Most often you need to unload it for a short time. You need to take care of it in the right way so you're not making it bulge further. Go through the proper steps of rehab and then it heals itself. Um, but let's say you came into a provider and the only MRI you get is this first one and you think you're screwed. I'm going to have this bad back for the rest of my life. And maybe that's what the provider says to you. And quite honestly, that's the language I get quite often from people. They never really get the follow-up MRI where maybe they see things are good. But what happens is that nervous system gets rewired in that short amount of time if you believe that you're screwed. It basically changes such that it doesn't give you a chance at thinking that you're not in appeal anymore. What's very visible is a ballooned up ankle. You see that it's not swollen anymore, that the bruises go down, you start moving it, you start bending it, and then you got a normal ankle again. The back is a hard thing. You don't get to see it. And I think that's also part of it. So there's a couple places like uh, L5 on S1, um, neck pain, certain crush injuries, concussions, stuff you can't see, rewire the nervous system to a greater ability. And some of that is you can't see it. Some of it's context, some of it's belief, some of it's provider information. Um, past experiences drive a lot of that. Um, but what comes clear is that discs heal 70% of the time in the first six weeks. Sometimes they take two years though. Um, and that's variable based on the health of the human, you know, uh, obesity and age and some stuff uh, happens like that. But Let's say you take MRIs of people that have never had back pain in their life and you put them on a graph based on age and you try to see what's going on. So a disc bulge by itself or degeneration by itself does not dictate you having pain. This is MRI data on people that have never had pain. So I'm almost 40 and I'm looking at the 40 column. 68% of people that have never had back pain are reporting or the MRIs show that there is disc degeneration. Um, facet degeneration is arthritic changes. Disc propulsion is like an actual pushing out. Uh, bulge is like a greater pushing out 50% of the time. And it goes up as you go on, and one would expect that. 
um, no one should have a perfect looking spine by the by aging, right? Like there should be signs of life lived. And this is a context problem providers have because people go in, they hurt, they take MRIs of them, they only see hurt people, they don't compare them against age related norms. And they don't know that you can actually have bulges 50% of the time and they not hurt. Um, it'd actually be weird if you didn't have it. So like if, you know, a lot of the people in this room or the, a lot of people I treat uh, believe that disc generation causes back pain when 93% of them in this study didn't have any, didn't have any pain. So it'd be like getting to 70 and not having any gray hair or wrinkles. It'd be weird. You're supposed to have signs of life lived, but it doesn't mean it has to hurt you too. But the language really matters. So if somebody has hurt their back, maybe they didn't have any problems before, but they did something. They get an MRI. They see that their discs are degenerated. The doctor says your discs are degenerated. They get, I'm screwed. And then they get this chronic rewiring process. I'll bet their MRI didn't look terribly different between their injury and when they got it. It's just that now they have pain. But you can have this and the absence of pain. So take example, cultural beliefs. A lot of people think uh, lifting is really bad for the back. And in truth and reality, like our genetics are meant for it. Like it's supposed to have a certain amount of stress on it for something to be healthy. And our backs are kind of the use it or lose it principle, just the same as like if you uh, go hit the gym, you'll, you'll keep your muscles. If you don't, you will lose them. Um, this is a study done on twins that had different jobs. So these are twins in different ages in life, uh, in their middle 60s, it looks like some in the forties, but they had to have different jobs. So one of the twins had to have a physical job and one of them had to have a sedentary job. Uh, so like one of them's a sales manager and one's a farmer. Um, discs actually look better in the people that were more physical. So I'll, I'll tell you time and time again, I'll have somebody in their seventies come in and say, uh, it's because I was on, I grew up on the farm and I was lifting all those hay bales and I was throwing all those around and that damaged my back. I'll put money on it that actually the research doesn't support that. It's probably the last 40 years of sedentariness that contributed to what your back looks like now. And you probably have lowered your capacity because you're not doing things. And then when you try to do stuff, it hurts. But here's the data, twins having better looking spines when they are more active. So when you're told doing stuff hurts you, you don't get to believing the real things that like discs are use it or lose it too. So what you're seeing here is on a graph of uh, basically the height of discs as people run more. So they compare the disc heights of people when they MRI them before running program and then after running program. And they find out the stress and impact of landing on discs. Uh, actually makes them taller and fluffier and stronger. It makes the ligaments around them stronger. And it gets more the more that you run. So they have people compared to 20 and 40 K distances, so kilometer distances and 50 K distances. So 31 miles of running is actually stimulating health changes in an improvement way towards taller and fluffier discs. It makes more space for the uh, joints and nerves um, and reality like most of our culture would think all that pounding on pavement is bad for your back and talk about a culture belief that just needs to change but that's what you get thrown into when you go into a doctor's office it's usually i hurt my back okay quit doing stuff lay in bed lay around a little bit and you totally get this process of one uh, rewiring the nervous system but it's a culture belief that drives some of this and that's what happens is you learn back pain uh, you totally get afraid of bending or picking up things, uh, doing those things that hurt you. You don't sit in that certain chair. You reduce your activities over life. And in reality, um, you probably need some more guidance. Like, what does that imaging really mean for your back? Do you really actually match clinically what that MRI looks like? What is the general belief you have or the community have? Is your family telling you don't move or don't do stuff? Um, what was your recovery life? Did you decide you could actually do stuff because uh, you had to, you know, um, the formula can be the same for anyone. It depends on what you're told and what you did and how much sedentariness you had, but you can learn a process of hurting more for every joint or body part or problem. So the nervous system does this without your permission. It's really common. So Pavlov's dog is really common about conditioning. 
the, the famous story is a Russian scientist Pavlov. You know, he basically wanted this dog to salivate when he got a treat, and then eventually salivate when you ring a bell, he gets a treat, and then uh, eventually you just ring the bell and he salivates, and he doesn't actually get a treat. Uh, but we're still mammals, so one of my coworkers, and I don't know if she's going to listen to this or not, but there's a printer in the back, or used to be, that was by her desk. So um, that was my opportunity to go back there and scare her, and it was just enjoyment for me. So um, I figured out that she knew I was coming when that printer went. She knew I was coming, so I had to be crafty. I had to wait a little bit. I had to print and then kind of like do stuff and then go get my stuff, and then I could go scare her. Uh, kind of had to keep her on her toes, you know. Chronic pain is more like someone got afraid of printing all the time under any condition. Anytime something printed, you would be scared of someone scaring you. If you got wired in such a way where your nervous system rewired itself uh, so that anytime anything printed anywhere, you got a problem of being scared, that's chronic pain. So that's no different from your nervous system setting up these association things where like low back pain doesn't let you bend because you're afraid of it. And showing it contradictions is super powerful. So what I do in the clinic a lot when somebody's got this chronic wiring process where they, they have this context, like if I bend over and pick up something, I'm going to damage my back. That's what they truly believe. I'll usually do some like fancy manual things and then I'll get them stretching and I'll do this stretch where it's called a prayer pose or child's pose in yoga where they're on their knees and then they're bending and they're kind of bending their back. And at that moment, they usually say, oh, it feels good. I love stretching my back like this. And then I'll show them, well, look at your back position right now. It's literally the same as when you bend over to pick up a pencil. And then you can see the click in there. Oh, yeah, that's true. I'm literally in the same position and it doesn't hurt. But I'm not associating the exact same circumstance where um, – Showing them the contradiction is super important. They believe bending over from the waist to pick up something is the problem, but literally the mechanical thing that they're doing when they're bending during that stretch that feels good is exactly the same thing. So that's the same thing about those fMRIs. Those MRIs, when that person would show painful areas of the brain lighting up as they're experiencing pain, it's a real experience. It's not in their head, as they say. So... Um, do that same fMRI in concept or in theory when they're in that stretch position, they won't see the same brain light up as in pain. They'll actually see what you would expect to see. So it becomes a learned condition response. And that's what I mean about chronic pain gets learned and it needs to be unlearned to some degree. So context is pretty darn important. And that's how belief is so powerful. So what you're seeing is uh, these little burger patties are actually fly burgers. Sounds gross, but the in Africa, I think it's Lake Victoria and a couple other places, they have uh, two times a year where they got this big bloom of flies that come out, and you'll see all the kids going around with pots and pans and collecting them. And they bring them to the adults and they'll smush them up in like burger patties and fry them. And it sounds disgusting. It's basically a pile of flies they're eating, right? So in this country, that sounds terrible and gross. Like, I don't know if I could do it either, but my belief growing up in this country is that bugs are gross and I don't eat them, right? In their country, they would they actually laugh at us because they truly enjoy this. This is a huge nutrition thing for them. This is a big calorie uh, boost for their year. They need this, and they love them. They actually enjoy them. You see the kids going back for seconds and thirds helpings, right? And to us, we're all kind of gross. I mean, you see a lot of people here uh, saying gross about it. And it's really, it's really funny because I had a patient in the clinic that adopted one of these tribe members in Africa while she was working there and raised them. And that kid did not like camping, did not like bugs, did not like being uh, outside at all, um, loved air conditioning, couldn't stand being dirty, was always showering all the time, and was only one generation removed from this generation that loved eating bugs. But that's how powerful context is, is it's truly what you believe. Like some of you listening to this probably believe it so strongly that bugs are gross, you're probably thinking that these people are wrong. Like they can't be right for believing that this is okay. That's, that's the trouble of it. That's how strong beliefs are. But that's where challenging your beliefs about what you believe to be true of what happened to you and how damaged you are and what your experience is can really set into your nervous system and be really difficult to change. So there's a lot to pack on this slide. I'm not going to actually go into a lot of it, but um, the main takeaways about this is the belief system about whether or not you make it to change 
and your brain being a prediction machine about guessing the next step about something that's going to hurt you is the process of getting this um, nervous system chronic rewiring process to go learn from the brain down to change all of these nervous system steps. It needs to be thoughts like changing those, like I'll never get better or my body is broken. Uh, they're just deeply unhelpful. Um, you need to change the outcome or change that expectation to change the outcome um, and have positive associations about that body of yours. And in reality, your body is never really against you. It's just trying to protect you. It's just a warning system. It's always in this don't die mode. It's all it knows how to do. And it's just warning you. You can thank it and move on. But a lot contributes to chronic pain. It's not just this rewiring process. Like we've got to put the work in. Losing muscle is something I'm going to show you. Uh, stopping movement, something's going to show you. Chronic loading, loading of sedentary tissue, or tissues in a sedentary way, like sitting a lot. Um, they all contribute to sensitivity changes in the nervous system, and it makes your avoidance uh, happen towards certain behaviors. Um, here, here's something that probably needs to be said is this study came out not that long ago. Uh, it depends on what you, pills you take over a lifetime. Uh, certain on over the counter anti inflammatories, they, they basically um, stop inflammation at the local source. But in reality, inflammation is there for a reason. Chemically, when our body needs to go fix things, it has to have that chemistry there to know how to fix it. So you injure something, inflammation cells go to that site. Then there's this whole chemical cascade that happens where your body goes through this whole total process of injured all the way to fixed. And if you hamper the um, initial phases of that by taking a lot of inflammation reducers, like uh, in this study, it came out on top was ibuprofen, naproxen. Um, let's see, uh, diclofenac. Um, certain drugs that are really common over the counter, then ultimately people developed a chronic pain. They never really fully healed. Whatever tissue they were trying to suppress because they felt better uh, actually developed a 10 year time frame at chronic pain. It became a chronic problem. Those pills that actually didn't were actually lidocaine and Tylenol um, and a couple other ones that work in a different mechanism where they're not removing the inflammation, they're just modulating pain. So, you know, basically some of this getting an injury has to happen for it to fix itself is feel pain, believe it or not. This uh, research study just came out like six months ago. So what happens is the nervous system basically gets super hypersensitive and it doesn't have a whole lot of room for stuff. Um, you know, maybe somebody did, could do a lot before and now they do very little and they have to rest a lot. And then the less they do, the less capable they are. And then that uh, nervous system is super sensitive in a narrow range. And what people do is they live in that narrow range and they never really nudge the edge. So in that circled area is where people tend to live because they're free of adding a little bit of load to the body in the right way where they start pushing it. So let's say if somebody hasn't exercised in a long time, first time they go get the gym, they're super excited and they go do too much and they get really sore. And that's kind of putting you in that red zone, the danger zone. When in reality, they probably should go do a little bit. And the next couple times, go do a little bit and get in that sweet spot range that's green. And you nudge this line of where you're living down at the bottom and eventually increase your capacity. Often chronic pain is a capacity problem. They think they're continued to be damaged, like their back just cannot tolerate doing certain things or their arthritic knee cannot tolerate doing certain things because it's damaged. But in reality, it's a capacity problem. It's not good at doing those things. So whenever you go to do it, it's not bad for it. Your pain system tells you it is, but it can actually do it. And you can nudge this line to increase the capacity so that gradually over time you have less pain. Something that's pretty complicated is people think when you're aging, you lose muscle. That's true in us Americans. Uh, in my exercise and activity uh, lecture, I definitely get into this a lot more, but there's a complicated chemistry about us. Our body needs muscles not to age. So when we lose muscle, 
it signals to the rest of our body to actually age. It's called senescence. It's bad for us to lose muscle. We're supposed to create a muscle density by a certain point in our life and maintain it throughout a certain portion of our life to basically keep our genetics happy so that we don't age further. So when I take an MRI of people's thighs, what's normal is people think they lose muscle over time. So on the left, you got two little steak, it looks like two steaks. Um, in reality, you're looking at a cross section of their thigh and the little white part in the middle is the bone. So there's age 25 and 63 on there on the left. And um, you kind of see like there's fat infiltrated into the muscle and there's a nice layer of fat around. And then if you look at the right side where there's three different people on an MRI, uh, one's 40, one's 74, and one's 70. So the 40-year-old and the 70-year-old look the same because they're both triathletes. The middle one is actually a sedentary person. So that looks more like a marbled steak, like a poor cut of steak you would see at the grocery store. And the top one and the bottom one maybe look more like a filet mignon where they aren't so much uh, fat in them. But in reality, this person's capacity is poor. So when they go do stuff, they hurt. And they think they're still damaged. And the reality is not that at all. It's just that they're just bad at their what they're doing. Here's an example of some lady that lives here in Tucson. And this article ran in Daily Star a long time ago. I think it was in like 2014 or so. They have these Spartan races, they call them. Uh, you run 13 miles. You do obstacles, like climbing monkey bars and going through electric wires and mud pits and stuff. This lady's 72 at the time of the article, and she's got a fusion in her back where she's got rods and pins holding her back together. She feels better because she's exercising and feels crappy when she doesn't. That's the power of belief. You can have these problems and still feel fine, and that's part of the change in belief that needs to happen for people. Just like this lady, she got really mad she couldn't get out of a chair without using her hands. Uh, so now she's deadlifting 200 pounds. She's 80 something. I can't remember what it was at the time of this article, but uh, power and belief is a really big deal. People can change. People always ask me this in the clinic. Um, uh, I'm old. Uh, is it possible that I get stronger or can I actually do this again? I always say yes. I kind of roll my eyes harder, basically. Uh, you know, this this person's just a nice example. Um, I don't expect everyone in chronic back pain to go out and start pushing weights around. But the intensity component of exercise is a big thing. So definitely check out my exercise and activity uh, article. But one Harvard study figured out that it is against our genetics to stop moving when we get hurt. It's a mismatch for our species. When we get hurt, I think, you know, if you want to think of that, this theory, like somebody hurts the back really bad and they're out in the savanna, if they lay still, uh, like say bed rest, a lion's going to eat them. They don't have a chance at surviving. They have to go feed themselves, so they have to go find food. And that means moving. They think this rewiring process basically can have the opportunity to happen because of rest, because of taking too much of the wrong things or wrong advice and sitting around too much. This rewiring process actually can have a foothold. If we move enough, then it seems to be the research shows that that's not true. So we really do promote against people with back problems when they've had an epic episode of back problems that they don't spend a lot of time laying around. There's an initial time where it really does hurt, like a number of days, right? With eventually gradually starting to do some movement, assuming normal life, this nervous system doesn't get chronic rewiring process. And I don't meet this person 20 years later and told me they hurt their back 20 years ago. And then how do you fix me? So, uh, it comes down to exposure therapy, though, a lot of it, like phobias. Um, I don't know why, but every front office person I've ever had working in a physical therapy clinic, it seems like maybe to do the interview process, they have to be scared of spiders. Um, so I do my own controlled experiments, and I don't care if they hear this because I'm going to keep trying to scare them. But I'll run experiments where I'll scare some of them at a different frequency than others. So... Um, I'll scare some of them once a day. I'll scare one. They hit me, by the way. Um, I'll scare some of them once a week. I'll scare some of them once a month. And what I find out, I'll always get a really scared, dramatic experience if it's once a month. Um, if I do it every day, eventually they actually get pretty desensitized to being scared. Um, and it happens pretty quickly. And then if I switch it where I scare the rate or the rate of scaring changes per person, that... Um, 
it'll switch. So they'll get uncustomed to being scared and then they get scared again. So dosage can really matter. The more I scared the person, the more they got used to spiders and they're like, haha, Jake, thanks for putting the spider in my desk, right? Um, and, but the ones that I want to keep scared all the time, I have to do it infrequent enough, like Maria with that printer. Uh, this is just my sick twisted humor that I have. Um, so anyway, someone has to gradually expose their back to the things that bother them like that. Their amygdala is popping up. When they see spiders, they're fearful. It's the same amygdala as they fear chronic pain or doing something that made them painful. And you need to expose them, learn, repeat, avoid things that uh, are called safety behaviors. So like don't avoid the painful things or stimulus and do it a fair enough chance that your nervous system gradually learns. You need to have enough dosage. It's like going to math class with enough frequency. You're just gonna learn math or new language. If you don't learn it, or if you don't go to like Spanish lessons long, fast enough or long enough, you're probably not going to learn it over time. You need to go enough times. So stay open minded about the process and um, really challenge what you believe to be true, but do it with enough frequency. Um, I'm going to skip a couple slides because it's, <laughs> it's long. But uh, basically, the pain is in your head is not a healthy way to approach this. Um, the nervous system remembers for you, most of it's in your head. So technically it's kind of true, but it's mostly your nervous system has changed. And so where do you go from here? You know, like I said, this is a really long topic and I can't have people sit here and listen to this forever, but so we've broken it down into exercise, sleep, diet, exposure, behavioral therapy, which is the mental therapy, uh, section, uh, that has a whole lot of helpful tools. And so please uh, continue on with the series of education on this concept so that you can continue to get the tools that you need. This is really just about like setting the stage so that you know why we're doing this and why it needs to happen. And then trust the process. I think when people stop becoming a victim of what happened to them or a victim of the healthcare system or a victim of whatever, that's just unhelpful. Like acceptance of the pain and stop fighting it. Um, there's a real relief whenever you stop fighting that pain and accept it without judgment. If you view it in a curious nature and kind of view it as a curious uh, way of looking at it and evaluating it, and eventually try to work around it without thinking about pain in general. Uh, don't be the only goal to not have pain. Be your only, don't, don't let the only goal that you have to not be in pain. You end up getting there indirectly. Do the right uh, recipe that I'm proposing here where you expose, learn, change, change your beliefs, and eventually you'll be out of pain. And don't and make some real specific functional goals. Don't focus on exactly just pain. Um, try to adopt the thought process that, yes, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Suffering is a separate negative uh, experience associated with pain that you make for your own experience. How you explain this as, to, as a provider, though, you really need to ensure the process of somebody that's going through chronic pain has the right language. Make sure you're having the right language. Nerves uh, can hurt, they can change, but they can change back. Give them resources and give them tools. Um, so uh, Curable is a good app for those, and I'm going to post it on the last slide here. They've even made it into like a cute, uh, cutesy cartoonish way uh, of going through. So it's free up to a point. Um, at some point, they ask for money. So, but basically this shows the cute version here where, you know, some challenging things happen to a body and they've had some health experiences. They get a major life event. They get an injury. They get a lot of stressful things, downward spiral happens, they get uh, chronic nervous system changes, they get some knowledge, they get some targeted rewiring process, they start exposing, they learn new neural pathways, their nervous system changes itself, and then they're in recovery. So they basically took a really intensely complicated thing and made a cute little cartoon of it. And I didn't come up with this on my own. So everybody on these resources listed on here, uh, if you're listening in at home, take a screenshot, take a picture, 
these are all where I borrowed all of this information from, uh, and they are continuation of tools that uh, put all the work in before I actually got to do this. So um, this is my resources, some of them. I can't put them all up here. Um, so anyway, um, like I said to my uh, retirement guy, um, I try to make this as simple as I can. It's a complicated uh, conversation to have. I, hopefully this was meaningful and I learned something. Uh, it doesn't do justice without the rest of the topics though. So you can have the rest of the tools to continue to combat what it is that makes your story of chronic pain, but uh, continue to learn as much as it makes sense so that you can take care of yourself. So with that, that is the end of the presentation. And I know Maya's usually got some questions online to give me. So thanks so much, Jake. Hey. I wanted to just ask um, if somebody is having issues with their chronic pain, um, how, what's the process for them to, you know, see somebody like yourself over at outpatient therapies and what can you help with? Yeah. I mean, I think this is a really broad conversation and the hard part is, is, you know, navigating your individual pain story. Uh, you need specific examples and direction and, and, uh, that's super, super helpful to work on one-on-one -on -one with somebody. You know, I think if you can take this formula and apply it and think uh, with all those resources listed as well, apply it and figure out how to fix it. But if you can't, um, you know, our clinic does require a referral to be there from your doctor. Um, not a lot of insurance is required to go to all physical therapy places. Uh, Medicare, TRICARE, certain insurances certainly do, but you can call uh, the clinic, um, here the two just you can google us the number is three two four seven zero zero five if you want your referral sent over there or you can call there and ask if you need one you can call whatever clinic you're familiar with and see if you need one but we can help you with the individual process of your pain story and getting you moving thank you so again that number is five two zero three two four seven zero zero five you do need to have a referral to come to tmc um, outpatient uh, therapy, but um, I know you have a great staff over there that can help um, with with anything that is related to pain, as far as you know, getting getting started perhaps after they see after they see their physician if they feel that that's the next step for them. Um, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Again, you did mention, and I mentioned. We have one more talk that is related to the chronic pain series. We did some at the end of last year, and the last one is nutrition and chronic pain, and that is coming up on Thursday, January 26th at 10 a.m. Uh, so if anyone is interested in joining us for that, please feel to give us a call in the office, which is 520-324-1960, and we can help get you signed up for that. Um, I'll turn it back over to you, Jake, so that you can wrap up in the room and answer any questions there. But thank you so much for being here today. All right. Thanks, Maya. Thank you so much again. Um, I wanted to just let you know what we have on the horizon for next week. Um, as we continue on with our active aging, we have a couple of things that will happen. We've got decoding nutrition labels. Um, coming up on Wednesday, January 18th at 10 a.m. and The Power of Sleep on Thursday, January 19th at 10 a.m. Again, if you are interested in any of these classes, please feel free to give us a call at 520-324-1960. Thanks so much.